All right. Well, how are you doing today? I'm excited to have you come and hang out. Um, this is my friend, Crystal Gonzalez, who is a, uh, what is your official title at Pandora? So it's officially national sales executive for the QSR vertical. I know it's a mouthful, but I'll <laughs> tell you basically what I do. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Tell us what you do. Tell us about your life. So sales, as you can imagine, it's not the first thought for um, someone who wants to get into the industry. I can tell you that was not where I thought I would end up. Um, it's just a path I stumbled upon and actually unlocked a lot more doors for me personally um, and professionally. But basically what I do is I work with a handful of national restaurant accounts. So QSR, meaning quick service restaurants. So I specifically work with McDonald's, Wendy's, KFC, Pizza Hut, Papa John's, um, Chili's in there. But yeah, so it's really fun because we get to, you know, the restaurant categories ever moving considering 2020 times. Um, so basically they lean on me for strategy and guidance in terms of the world of audio and digital advertising, specifically on Pandora, but not only with Pandora's, but we're also partnered with SoundCloud, which is the number three streaming service in the world. Um, and then also Sirius XM. So. Well, that's fun. So yeah. tell me a little bit about, we, we talk about, you know, account executives who work at agencies and can you tell me a little bit about how your job is similar, but also how it's different and do you work with account executive from agencies? Like when, when, where's the overlap and what's the difference in the title? Yeah. So the fun part about my job is, you know, you think sales rep and you're like, oh, cold calling, trying to, you know, get people to buy something. But actually my job is more from the strategy perspective. So I put my thinking cap on from the lens of what are the challenges of the advertiser? What is the agency trying to solve for? So I actually get to work with brand managers, account executives, media planners, and buyers, um, basically helping them fit the puzzle pieces and try to figure out, okay, what offering does Pandora have that we can best achieve their goals or what they're trying to accomplish? And then even in turn, we provide them learnings and insights um, through third-party measurements, resources, and things like that. So I work with them on the daily, but it's mainly to be a resource and a strategist more than a sales rep. Very cool. And how did you kind of get to where you are? You said this is not what you had like planned out. What's the what's the journey that you've taken to to get? Because that's a that's a pretty impressive title. Like, uh, how how did you get to? How did you kind of end up taking that path? So when I was in college, I really looked to a mentor. Um, she is in marketing as well. And I just knew her actually, she was one of my mom's good friends um, throughout her life. And in college, I actually started going to school for to be a teacher. And I quickly learned that just wasn't for me, but I wanted to work with people in some capacity. So as you can imagine, teacher, sales reps, I guess it kind of goes similar path. You're educating people in something. But um, so in that regard, I basically leaned on my mentor to help introduce me to people in her network. And I did informational interviews. I reached out to people like just asking for 30 minutes of their time, whether it's a phone call or treating them to coffee um, or lunch and just kind of pick their brain. Like, what do you do? Like what other paths are out there than the standard titles that you hear about? Um, and so basically I had met with someone in the Wall Street at the Wall Street Journal in Chicago. I'm originally from Wisconsin. Um, so met with people in Chicago and they were like, you need to apply for our ad sales track program. And I'm like, sales, like, I don't know, but it's the Wall Street Journal and on the digital team. So at the time, like this looked like a really good, cool opportunity. So I pursued it. Um, basically they flew final round. They flew 25 of us out to New York. We had final round interviews and they picked six people and basically dispersed us across the country. So that's how I ended up in Dallas. Um, so I was at the Wall Street Journal for two years and that's where I started my career as um, a sales planner and a sales coordinator where I basically supported the sales rep behind the scenes. So I was executing media campaigns, getting them live, monitoring delivery. So kind of the behind the scenes, the work, and, but I also, that's how I got to sales basically. Now you touched on something there that I think is, is interesting. And uh, this is a conversation I was having with a student the other day, but you talked about um, your mentor and I had a student ask me the other day, like, well, how do I find a mentor right now? And historically, my answer would be like, go to an AAF meeting, go hang out, go meet professionals. But we don't have those right now, those in-person meetings. So 
Um, this is not what we had talked about originally is, is the line of questioning, but do you have any insights or just any tips you would share for students who are kind of struggling to find a mentor like how or, or how to how to meet people and network and this digital era? Yeah, it's definitely tricky right now. So I feel you. Um, but I would say the biggest thing you can do is don't force a mentorship because obviously it has to be a mutual relationship and you want it to work and you have to gel. Um, but I would say definitely attend those online virtual events. Um, or if you can see somebody like on a Zoom and say, hey, I saw you attended this AAF event or um, you know this networking event, like sidebar them, kind of like what I did with in-person coffee, sidebar and say, hey, can I have 30 minutes of your time? I'd love to pick your brain just about what you do and kind of explain your background. Um, and then also during that conversation, ask them to like, is there anybody that you could introduce me to so I can keep exploring, keep learning? Um, and I can say like, that is the best way to get involved and network because that's honestly how I got to my job at Pandora, how I got to my previous job in programmatic advertising. So it definitely helps, but the biggest thing is take the risk. It is worth it. Like put yourself out there. I can tell you when I was in college, I'd like, I wasn't super social. I wasn't the first to raise my hand or, you know, pick up the phone. But if you put yourself out there, it's honestly going to open doors. And I know that like LinkedIn is a tool that is super, super helpful. And, you know, we advocate it all day long, but it also sounds like what you're saying is that if students reach out to someone on LinkedIn, they should probably put like a personalized message or something. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say even do a little homework on the person too. Like if you can find some common ground, like, Hey, um, I see you went to TCU. I'm currently a student at TCU, like would love to pick your brain about your path or, you know, find something of interest, common interest that could maybe grab their attention. And it also shows that you, you really truly meant to reach out to that individual. Um, but yeah, same thing with LinkedIn. I know sometimes people could feel like it's a little bit of like a cold call or a cold email, but personalizing it really goes a long way. One, one that I think is also, because you don't always like share the university with someone, right? Um, right? But if you can find common interest in some of their like philanthropy and volunteer work, mm -hmm. typically that's something that they're passionate about. Like people don't volunteer for things that they don't care about. So if you can find some common ground where they are, you know, part of, you know, a, a philanthropy effort that they sit on the board and you have some common experience with something you volunteered for or something. That, that's a great conversation starter, I think, Absolutely. as well. So, um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about media. So right now we're talking about kind of broadcast in general. So we've uh, discussed the, the principles of what goes into uh, creating like a radio ad or, you know, traditionally a commercial, but these things have obviously all evolved with digital. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about even just, let's start with just format. How has format changed between uh, radio spots versus what you guys do at Pandora um, with like streaming audio spots? Yeah, so it's definitely evolved a lot. Um, so Pandora started back in 2008. So we were the pioneers in the streaming space. Um, but it's definitely evolved because you know, back then people would just create one audio spot, one size fits all for your radio, online, you know, streaming platforms, whatever it may be. Um, but now it has evolved so much that we're on over 3000 connected devices. Um, so you basically have to mold your spot to fit the platform. Now, let me just put a little caveat in there. I am not a creative expert, so I can't tell you how to create it per se or write copyright for you, but um, but at least, you know, I do have an understanding of, you know, how we can make it fit the advertiser and the audience. Um, we always say what's good for the advertiser is good for the listener. Um, and so we try to keep that experience because we want the listeners to keep coming back. And then you also want the advertisers to keep coming back. So you have to find that common ground um, and happy medium. So I think that's why it's evolved so much. And now with the targeting capabilities out there, it's just in tracking and measurement just to determine what success was made um, because every impression counts. Like you may only get your one shot at listening or that listener hearing your spot. Um, so you have to make that first impression and then you want them to keep coming back. So I think how it's evolved really is more customization to platform, customization to the audience, 
And then also, of course, you know, you want it to be true to the advertiser. So now how it's evolved is it's no longer that one size fits all. Now we're talking about things like a sonic logo or sonic identity. And what I mean by that is, you know, what noise or sound is your brand going to make that's going to drive the audience to do something? So if you think about your daily life, you hear an alarm clock. What do you do? You wake up you get ready for the day. You hear your, your text message ping on your phone. What does that make you do? It makes you go check that text message to read it. Well, why can't ads do the same thing? So now, you know, you hear McDonald's. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. What does it make you think? McDonald's. So we're talking a lot about that with brands, but then in turn, you know, what's their, their quick slogan for KFC? They had to pause their finger licking good for obvious reasons, but you know, that's KFC. So it's really fun to work with these brands that like have these, you have a visual, you already know what the kernel looks like, but then when you hear something, you immediately have that visual and it, all of a sudden you have this theater of the mind where everybody goes to their own place. Um, so that's why audio is super powerful. And I think that's how it's evolved is it's no longer just like, Hey, here's the meal deal. Go buy my $20 bucket or my $5 fill up. But you can now create audio to match what the visual looks like and it sends the audience to a certain space. Now, I'm not just speaking about Pandora specifically, but audio is in your video ads, it's in your TV spots. Think about anywhere sound lives, it's becoming more prevalent than ever Like to actually have an audio strategy. That's right, it sounds very Pavlovian of just figuring out kind of like the audio, the audio tick that'll make people react in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned uh, that uh, kind of going back a second, you said something about like you're on 3000 connected devices. What, did, what does that mean exactly? Yeah, so basically anywhere Pandora can, you can listen to Pandora. So on your mobile device, your desktop, tablet, you know, you can listen on your Xbox or even Samsung refrigerators. Like, Basically, Pandora is in so many different devices, which provides the opportunity for the advertiser to follow a listener throughout their day. Um, especially from the restaurant category, people are making mealtime decisions in the moment. So it's more important than ever to target that listener, reach them right in the right time. Um, and then of course they have their whole media mix. So they have their TV spots, they have their terrestrial radio. So how does that fit the puzzle piece? Um, but yeah, so significantly, amount of connected devices. I actually recently heard a stat by 2021, there will be 25 billion, with a B, connected devices in the US. And the average of that is three connected devices per US person. Like it's insane. Now it's basically challenging marketers more than ever to figure out how you're going to be connected and like basically you have to be smart because all, the only thing that's growing is the number of devices and they're getting smarter so we have to be one step ahead as marketers i started to think that that number sounds ridiculous and then i started thinking of every connected device i have and that mm -hmm. seems that seems low actually <laughs> well especially with the holidays coming up too like it's you know that's always a hot item yeah so um you, you had talked a little bit about um, kind of uh, things evolving in all these different connected devices. And, and then we spoke a little bit about, um, you know, mealtime decisions about kind of when that happens in the day. It sounds like there is some, some research attached to the, the logic of when to place an ad or things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the role of uh, research and data and analytics to um, the actual placement and, and maybe even the creative of the ad itself? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to depend, you know, on a few things up front, because there's a lot of variables when you think about your ads, you know, what are you trying to get the audience to do? First of all, is it order online? Is it go through the drive through? Is it walk into a location? Um, so that's a huge factor at the end of the day. That's what the advertiser cares about. How am I driving sales? So keeping that in mind, but then also you have to think about the audience receiving that ad, you know, are they ready for an ad? I mean, ads are everywhere and it, we're, you know, people don't love them. So how do you make it more respectful of the audience and then also where they're actually gonna be like resonating with the ad and may want to take action. So I can tell you from Pandora's perspective, we have an algorithm on the back end, you know, when the ads actually serve. So when you first come onto the Pandora platform, you do get a display ad. Um, 
right as it kicks off, but we're not going to hit you with an audio ad right away. Because why did you come to Pandora? Well, you came to hear music. So we're not going to disrupt that, that want or need. Um, and I see that with a lot of other platforms such as a Hulu. And then of course you have your TV spots um, as well. So those are specific, specific pods. Um, but it's basically when I work with my advertisers, we're trying to figure out that strategy. Like how many times is it effective to reach this listener to make them actually do something? Um, for example, we recommend two to three times um, monthly, you know, I would say, depends. But it depends on their target, it depends if it's national, those would be national um, targets. But I would say you have to think about all the different variables um, when aligning that ad. And then in terms of creative, same thing there. Um, you have to think about what you want them to do and how, whether it's gonna be an audio spot, we also have video products on the platform. So just kind of, again, how is that fitting that whole puzzle piece? So we've talked a little bit about how things have changed and evolved. Um, how do you perceive that things are the same? Uh, obviously there's the, the digital pieces evolve the way that we do metrics and analytics and, and targeting and all that, but what are some of the things that you perceive to be like similar success strategies with just traditional radio to what you guys are doing at Pandora? Yeah, one of the things that's always remained constant is the listeners, at least for my category, the listeners are always looking for food. So there's always an audience, right? We've all got to eat. But in terms of advertisers, the thing that's remained constant is the strategy. I would say like a baseline awareness play and then a second layer of digital products such as video or maybe a high impact placement um, or even like sponsoring an event, something like of a plus up, make a splashy moment, but that you can't put all your eggs in that one splashy moment. You have to have some sustaining media around it. Um, so really the strategy perspective, like that holistic look from the top of the marketing funnel, driving that awareness, and then pulling the listener down the marketing funnel to get them to take action or make that sale. I think that's the biggest thing that's remained constant at the end of the day. It's just a matter of what puzzle pieces are you going to fit along the way on that marketing funnel to make it actually, you know, get that sale. Okay, great. Um, I know that, you know, we, we've talked about uh, segmenting audiences, whatnot, and I know that um, Pandora has their, like a VP of diversity, but that's not necessarily, you know, a lot of companies when they have a VP of diversity, it's a lot about internal culture, but at Pandora, I know having heard Mike speak, um, that, uh, the VP of diversity, the role is, is about culture, but it's also about how do you connect with the cultures of your audience? Can you talk a little bit about the, the role of diversity in advertising from the kind of Pandora perspective? Yeah, so especially as you can imagine with music, we all have different tastes, but at the end of the day, we all, you know, we all go back to our culture and our roots and especially with multicultural audiences, like that's huge. Um, you think about Hispanic audiences and wanting and needing that Latin, Latin genre or Latin artist, but also at the end of the day, they're listening to Drake and Ed Sheeran too. So, you know, the biggest thing with advertisers is being able to resonate and relate to the consumer more in a one-to-one -one as best you can. Yes, we're spreading our dollars and we're trying to reach that wide net, but you also have to remember the audience you're speaking to. Um, the beauty of Pandora is we don't care what music you listen to because we all love music, but you can actually, from an advertiser perspective, we have an algorithm so we can actually use or target that audience one-to-one. -one. So if you're thinking about it from a multicultural perspective, um, you know, we've actually done studies in the art and science of sound. Um, so for example, if you're in a Mexican restaurant and you hear a mariachi band, it makes that food taste a little bit better. Um, so that goes along. We have our advertisers specifically target the right audience and pair that with the right creative. It's definitely important you don't just straight translate um, if you're using a Spanish language ad, because um, it can be offensive if it's um, mixed up. But and then also reaching, you know, the black audiences, you know, you obviously want to be respectful and understanding and, you know, you want to show that you know them because actually those guys, they're tech forward. They are leading the charge in connected devices. They are the ones ordering online more, they're shopping more. So it's important that advertisers are showing that they are relevant and know and understand these audiences, you know, rather than just the full general market, um, you know, and I don't even love that we have a, a separate term multicultural or diversity for this because they're part of everybody um 
that it's just a matter of figuring out which audience you're trying to reach at the end of the day. Um, even beyond multicultural audiences, we have over 3000 audience segments. So for example, if you're wanting to reach Pizza Hut enthusiasts or a recent Domino's visitor, we have those types of segments um, or even audience segments where let's say somebody saw a Sonic TV ad and then we want to reach them again later on Pandora, we can do that. Um, so there's ways to kind of, again, fit the mold and just try to make their media strategy work holistically. So uh, without going into like too much detail, can you kind of talk at just a very, very high level how all that connectivity works? Because obviously, uh, how does Pandora know that I, you know, ate at Sonic or something? So um, can you talk a little bit about the role of data in targeting? Oh, it's huge. So, so important. And I can tell you whether you're going to be a brand manager, account executive, even a creative, like there are third parties out there that we partner with, like that you can gain insights and learnings from, like, it's so important. Um, so depending on who the advertiser partners with, because like I said, there's so many out there. We, uh, one of our preferred foot traffic measurement partners is called placed slash Foursquare. Um, Foursquare just acquired placed. Um, this last year. So what we can do there is we can actually track um, foot measurement, foot traffic measurement. So how they do that is through survey based. So they have a small pool of people um, basically who were targeted, exposed, and then who were unexposed. And then we kind of do comparisons from that and how it works from the one-to-one -one, um, data that we can receive on the Pandora end. So you're a logged in user. So we already know your email address, your birth date, your, if you're a male or female, your zip code. So we can gather, start gathering all these insights based on who you are. Um, and then also take it further, the type of music you're listening to, the genres, or even the device you're listening on. And we're able to turn that over to advertisers, of course, confidentially. We're not you know, straight up saying Michael Magnus went to a pizza hut last week. But what we can say is, you know, a male who lives in this zip code visited a pizza hut last week now, you know, let's make a lookalike model of, of this person, and then we can target more males in this zip code who might visit this Pizza Hut location. So we're able to kind of take that data and really evolve it and stretch those marketing dollars. So it sounds like there's, in all elements of advertising with what you guys do, um, there's, there's no way to escape analytics. It's just like a piece that's there. <laughs> yes. um, but can you, with that, can you tell me like, what are the skills that, um, you know, students and, and young professionals might have value in working on? What are the things that, whether it's certifications or programs they can learn, what are the things that they can do right now to be proactive, to give themselves a competitive edge when they graduate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the biggest thing is one networking. I think that more than anything, because you're going to learn a lot um, from those individuals. And then also when you get that land that job, they're going to train you and they're going to learn, you know, teach you all these things. But I would say check out LinkedIn learning, um, read the trades, like get to know brands. What is the what is the industry up to, even though it doesn't pertain to you right now, like you're not working on that specific client but learn about what these, how these clients are thinking about things. You know, why are they implementing the strategies they are? Or some say, you know, sales are up. Well, why are sales up? What's in, what's attributing to that? And I really think, you know, if you're digging into those, those articles and understanding, I'm sure you're following ad week and ad age, you know, subscribe to the newsletters. AAF has a smart brief that comes out monthly and even daily. Um, so check those out, read the articles, spend 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, a couple times a week. Um, it really will help you. And then not only that, it will help you learn the terms. There's a bajillion acronyms in our industry. Um, so to be honest, when I first started, I know this sounds very elementary, but I did flashcards at first. Cause I was like, what are all these acronyms? You know, we're talking about CTR, CTA, CPE, like what are all these acronyms and what do they mean? And how is it going to relate to my job? Learn the acronyms because if you don't, you're going to miss the boat because it'll go right over your head. And I, I still even run into that. Like people talking about like headless CRM and I'm like, I, of course. Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, with that, I, I have a question I always love to ask. And that is for, for the students, um, if you could kind of go back in time and tell your college self 
you know, one or two pieces of advice, um, what would those be of kind of how to set yourself up for success? Oh man, I gotta think about this one. Um, let's see, if I could go back, one, I would say for sure the industry is more fun than I thought it would be. I actually, some of my very best friends are in the industry um, and networking is huge, like bigger than I thought. And the community is smaller than you think. So never burn a bridge because um, even across the country, it's very small. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything. I mean, definitely network. I know I've said that a couple of times, but I truly mean that. It's, it makes a world of a difference. Um, and then also, I guess, like to that point, get to know everybody that that way you're going to put your name out there and be like, oh yeah, I remember Michael when he approached me and we had this good conversation, get like basically spread this web, get to know everybody and learn what they do and understand it. And then try to figure out how you can map that back to your own. Um, even once you land a job, like get to know everybody, it's definitely going to help you personally and professionally, um, whether you stay at that job or beyond that. I think that's one of the biggest things um, that I learned up front. One thing I'll say with that too, that I think is always important is when getting to know people does not mean making sure they know everything about you. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a, a common mistake I see with a lot of young people that they're like, I have five minutes of FaceTime with this person. I need to tell them everything that I know so that they'll remember me. Um, and I don't know if that's always the best approach versus just having a genuine conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Like don't spew your resume. Don't read your resume. Just, you know, letting them know who you are. Like, again, try to figure out what that hook is with them and leave that lasting impression. Just think if there's one thing, just one thing, I want this person to take away from this conversation and like know about me. What is that? Um, and I think the biggest thing is, you know, you're selling yourself. So, you know, check that out, look at, you know, elevator pitches or, you know, how you can sell yourself in that regard. You know, I, I know it sounds very, and you guys sure you guys talk about in the classroom, but, you know, think about if you have 30 seconds on an elevator and you don't want to spew all this information and you want to make it impactful, like, what are you going to say? Like, be ready with that. I know it sounds weird, but like practice it out loud, practice it with a friend because it really actually makes a difference. And I can tell you from the virtual world, I know it's weird right now, but like you have to make it as comfortable and natural and play it cool, you know, as possible. But it, trust me, like if you can just make that impression, it, it'll go far. Well, awesome. Well, I have one last question that I want to ask. And I, I know that you said that you're not a creative per se, although we all are creative in our own right. Um, but I heard a phrase the other day that I thought was really interesting. I was watching the, uh, the Goodby and Silverstein masterclass um, highly recommend it if you haven't watched it. It's, it's awesome. Um, but one of the things they referred to when they're going through and creating both um, television commercials and you know, radio commercials and whatnot is this idea of mass intimacy, that you're trying to create a one-to-one -one connection with all of these people, but you're doing it with a very similar spot. Now, I know that now we have the more, more ability to target, right? So you're not giving everybody the same commercial, but um, do you have any insights for those who are, you know, right now, maybe in class writing radio commercials and television commercials of ways to potentially make that one-to-one -one connection, knowing that they're also still appealing to a mass audience? Yeah. So one point I want to make too, is I know we talk a lot about targeting and the ability to slice and dice and make our media plans do certain things to different audiences. Remember, that's not always the best case. If you slice and dice it too much, then it's not going to work. And then it's just, you know, you're not going to have scale and you're not, it's not going to have the effective reach that you want. And, you know, in terms of action, I think the biggest thing as far as creative goes, be true to the brand and the authenticity will show through whatever it is. If it's a radio spot or the visuals, be true to the brand. I think at the end of the day, if you're creating that brand identity, it's going to resonate more and then it's going to set you up for future success. So going back to the sonic identities, or if you see something visually on a screen and you know, like, oh, I know that brand. I see those golden arches. I know who it is. So you kind of have to think about that from the, the perspective. Yes, you're trying to make your, your ad dollars go far because you're right. You're, fit, you're trying to fit one size fits all. 
But I think the biggest thing at the end of the day, let's say you have limiting marketing budgets because they all do, let me tell you. They want limit, limiting marketing budgets, but they want the world that never has been done before. Anyway, but I'm just saying though, um, the biggest thing is be true to the brand, make it work for you and start building on that. Um, and I think, you know, as you land a job, get to know the brand like your clients. If you don't, if you're, let's say your agency side, get to know the brand like the client does live it, breathe it. What keeps them up at night? What are the challenges? What is the challenges they're trying to solve for? If you put your thinking cap on like they do, not only is it going to resonate well with your, your client, like, oh, they really truly are embracing this, but also it's going to get you farther in terms of your creativity. Speaking of clients, I know you have a meeting here very shortly. Do you have any, um, just final thoughts, general words of wisdom, anything we didn't go over that you would thought we might talk about just any closing ideas yeah so um one feel free to reach out to me um if you want to network connect i am more than happy to hop on a zoom and just chit chat and if there's any way that i can help because somebody did that for me in college i want to repay the favor so i truly mean that um michael knows where to find me but also uh, reach out to her on linkedin you should probably write a message they've heard this before <laughs> Yeah, grab something. If you've made it this far in the presentation, like grab something that we just chatted about and I'll know what you're talking about. But anyway, um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway is this industry is so much fun. Like it really isn't just another job with a paycheck. Like if you truly dig in and like just understand and embrace it, like you can have a lot of fun in this industry and you can make a lot of friends from across the country. And then two, you get to do really fun work that you get to actually see online and make an impact in the industry. Like how powerful is it that we as advertisers get to control like what spending power is happening in this country? Or for example, we get to work with some of the best creatives. Like my call here in a little bit is with Wyden and Kennedy and they are like creative masterminds and it just blows me away. And I learn so much from them. And I love that I get to be in the room with people who are smarter than me, but it also gives me the chance to learn from them and then also, you know, grow from it too. So know that yes, it's challenging, but it's a lot of fun. And it's, if you work hard, it's going to pay off and you're going to see really cool stuff on the internet. And then you get to take it home to mom and say, look, I did that. Hang it on your fridge. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for hanging out and thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been really insightful and uh, we just really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, Michael.